All right, yeah, part three of, um, yeah, Mark's request, the Zappa documentary. Yeah, let's go. Frank said, you should play synthesizers. And I said, I don't want to play synthesizers. And Frank says, right to my face, you take yourself too seriously and you don't invest in yourself enough. Frank detested the mere word of being heavy musically because he was heavy musically. You know, I play Bach chorale, you know. I want to play Mozart you know, or, or some jazz, you know. I want to be heavy, you know. And as I said before, he detested the word heavy. So, but anyway, he would put, he says, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to buy you a synthesizer and I'm going to put it on your keyboard. And whenever you feel like messing with it, you know, he says, you may bump it every now and then, it'll make a sound. And then, uh, you know, I'll just leave it there. And so he left it there, and occasionally I would start, you know, I would <laughs> come in before rehearsal, and I would, mm, it would make a noise, and then I would push it in, and I don't want to play that thing. We're going to go directly into another song, which has to do with the delicate subject of flying saucers and information pertaining to the origins thereof previously withheld from the American public. And I'm saying simply this, the song should have been entitled, It Was Only Swamp Gas, but it's really called The Inca Roads. And it goes like this. I said, I can't do this, Frank. So he put it there one day, and then he's, he had Ian set up a little sound for me. And I started playing, and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And you could bend notes. You could bend notes. I'm a piano player, you can't bend notes. I can bend notes. You mean I can be like Johnny Guitar Watson, or I can be play the blues on a synthesizer? I said, that's it. sitting down at, this, at, the, at the keyboards. And he says, uh, well, I need you to sing this note. And I said, I don't sing. And he says, George, we need you to sing this note. Can you sing? Uh, I said, yeah, I can do that. He said, all you got to do is da, hit that note. You know, when, when I cue, he cue, da. I said, OK, I can do that. And that's how it started. It became more and more and more. And eventually, I was doing did a vehicle come from somewhere around there just to land in the Andes. Was it running? Did it have a motor? Was there something different? It, it ran into that. Did a vehicle come from somewhere out there just to land in the Andes? Was it round? Did it have a motor? Or was it something different? Show up. I don't do this. I was in, I think his best band 
Man, that band could play anything. And I go back nowadays listening to that music, and I don't know how in the world we did it. I, it's just amazing to me. We instinctively knew what Frank wanted. He would just he'd go like, <laughs> and we knew exactly what to do, and Frank just loved it. And not only that, I got to tell you one other thing. He was totally underrated as a guitarist, totally. dance music and Frank came to the club and he says you're my new lead vocalist and I said how could I possibly sing for you if I've never heard your music I said but just for the hell of it who's in your band and he says well George Duke and John Luke Ponty said, whoa George Duke John Luke Ponty the French violinist and George Duke the jazz piano player they're in your band and he says yeah I said well you, you must be pretty good your music must be pretty damn good because they're the best and I said, well, I'll tell you what, here's my card. When do you come back from Europe? November, give me a call. He says, well, you come for an audition? I says, yeah, sure, I'll come for an audition. He says, okay, here's the deal. You come for an audition, you don't have to sing. You listen to the band, if you like it, you're automatically in the band. You don't even have to sing a note. I said, okay, well, that, that makes it much easier because I don't know your music, and it'll be rather difficult. And that's how it happened. I went to Los Angeles when he returned. I listened to the band, and I saw my destiny. George Duke. That's what I wanted to do. I said, here's an opportunity I've never had in my life to meet the guy that I, my idol. And I just wanted to meet him. But when I heard the music, I mean, I mean, can you say orgasm on the microphone? It was like an orgasm, the best I ever had in my life. be fair yeah like if you're a, if you're anything and you really want to be amongst the best like zappa's band is that but he's gonna push you like you're seeing the vocal things that i mean these people are like accomplished musicians that he's kind of sunning Frank Zappa is here, yeah, son in them. But yeah. Let's keep going.
we didn't necessarily have to rehearse the notes so much because he used to write everything down and we used to read it but as time went on as you got in the band and you understood what Frank expected of you it was not necessary for him to write everything down well, when we used to practice for the rehearsals Tom and I used to live together and that we had a lot of tremendous competition because George Duke and John Luke Ponty were in the band and they were playing the easy instruments but we had the same parts on the hard instruments, so we had to work a lot harder than those guys. And we wanted to make sure that whenever they came into this rehearsal and they said, well, Frank, I, I just didn't have time this week. Oh, I shouldn't say that, should I? I just didn't have time to practice, you know, so. Meanwhile, we've got it. Now, the way we did that was we, we made a go. We said, okay, we have to get all the way through the piece perfectly, or we have to start back at the beginning again. So by the time we played this for about, you know, a few hours, we, we had it, basically. And yeah, so but we had the beginning a lot better than the end. <laughs> <laughs> mm. He was improvising in his mind when he wrote the music for these really complex um, modern classical pieces. The bebop tango, which used to be called the Malcolm McNabb. What was the tango? What was the time thing that was going on behind that? Brum, brum, yeah. Brum, brum, brum. That's it. You know, I think he would meet people, like I was telling you about Malcolm, Malcolm McNabb. He, 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 he got really inspired by him, and he said, this guy, I remember him coming and saying this to me at some rehearsal or something. You know, this guy, Malcolm McNabb, came over, and he played this new piece, and it was the best thing that anybody, best anybody ever played any of my music, you know? So, you know, this, this, this gave him the hope that his stuff could be played. Yeah, it was sometime after the... Yeah, I have to say, that was one of the things I first thought about Zappa, listening to him. I don't envy any of them for being in his band. I mean, it's amazing to watch, it's amazing to listen to, it's amazing to hear their stories of how he kind of moulded them and, and made them advance beyond what they even thought possible but still it's too much hard work I, the, I remember starting Frank Zappa and Rush around the same time and Rush is exactly the same there's only three of them but I would not want to have been one of them three as great as much as I love Rush this is too complicated like it uh, yeah but yeah hold on two secs uh yeah uh, let's go let's carry on Grand Wazoo tour when Frank called me up and asked me to come up here. It might have been in this very room. And he says, uh, play this. I want I want you to play this. And he showed me this page here with all these notes on it. <laughs> and I was thinking, you gotta be fucking kidding. I mean, this, uh, this, I don't know if I can play that. He says, well, let's hear it. So this is what I've been working on for the last 30 years. <laughs> this set of notes. And I pretty much know a lot of it without looking at the music.
damn, he found some good, some good ones there, you know. <laughs> I've been working on it for all this 30 years, but it doesn't seem to be getting that much better. <laughs> three bars, pray, hope for the best. Mm -hmm. always a piece that we couldn't play. He always wanted to find out how far he could go before it was too far. And so there are pieces that's just not possible for humans. So finally he'll try it a couple times and he'll realize that, okay, there's the, there's the boundary. I can do anything up to this point. And then he wants to always keep us challenged as well as maybe the listening public and himself. You know, I think he was just very interested in pushing the boundaries of music. of the musicians that worked with Frank is apparent. You can just tell, even from the four drummers that I know that I've worked with in the studios, Ralph Humphreys, and then there was Terry Bozio, and then, of course, Vinnie Caliuta and Chad Wackerman. I mean, these are probably four of the currently best drummers in the world. Being a percussionist, I was very interested in the way he wrote rhythmically. And... Mm -hmm. Frank definitely wrote wonderful, wonderful rhythms that came from India, Africa, everywhere but America. I'm stressing rhythm because he really impressed me rhythmically, the things that he wrote rhythmically. I mean, the tempo would be here, one, two, three, four. One, three, four, five, seven, eight, ten, twelve. I only put 12 in a beat. He would put 17 notes in one beat, you know? I mean, he just had wild and, and accenting, different accents for those beats. And when you look at it, say, oh, I don't know, that's impossible. Boom, he would play it for you so you could hear him play it, you know? The rhythms were just always the, the key elements that... Uh that made it really stand out. I mean, you ask any drummer who ever tried to play the Black Page, you know, I mean, again, there's like a handful of guys who can do it. And the ones who were able to do it played in Frank's band, you know, and he would audition them. You know, it's called the Black Page for a reason because there's so many notes. <laughs> and somehow got the gig. So uh, the music was more difficult. I was familiar with the concepts of, uh, you know, these um, superimposed odd rhythms over time, like five over three or this kind of thing uh, from school, but uh, I had never seen it to that level of difficulty, that much of it being used, because uh, it was sort of a trademark of Frank. <laughs> Thank you. 
maybe a year later, he walked into rehearsal one day. He had a very deep voice, you know, he said, what do you think about this, Bozio? And he, he handed me this sheet, and it said The Black Page. And, and it was uh, written from my drum set. And, you know, Frank was uh, a drummer to begin with, so we always had this little affinity that way, you know, r rhythmically. And I remember one night uh, when we finished rehearsals and I was still playing, just working on these last couple bars and I, I finished the piece and just happened to nail it, you know? And, um, and he said, Bozio, you're a fucking genius. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> was very successful doing that, you know, working with the right people, knowing the techniques himself on how to, to make these things sound the way that they did. But the funny thing is he had a quote uh, where he said um, the one thing he excels at is failure. And I think, you know, I understand why he said it and it, what it was is that he never got things to be exactly as he wanted but they're already at such a high level. So the level that he was thinking is probably unattainable. Yeah, I think that's one of the key things to help someone who doesn't understand Zappa and his music to understand is that <clears throat> he's a drummer. At his core, he's a drummer, and this you like when you hear that, it just makes so much sense. All of everything's rhythms, everything, where it becomes not about the notes, but the yeah, the basically the percussion sounding of the other instruments too, like it's a yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things I think that if people struggle to get Zappa, you just say, yeah, the fact that he's a drummer. But yeah, no, this is interesting. This is interesting. And I do see, because you see, like, little crossover bits, but of the last one we did, the last documentary, um, like the George Duke. But I'm sure there was more in the George Duke in this one as well. But yeah. And again, like you said, Terry Bozio, like one of the greatest drummers of all time. And the thing he won't remember is the fact that Frank said he was a genius once for playing something he'd wrote. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's part three. Yeah, that's the reaction. <laughs> 